Okay, uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, I think we'll make a start. Uh, welcome to this evening's lecture. I'm Nick Pierce, the director of the Institute for Policy Research. Thank you very much for coming out on such a filthy evening, uh, braving the weather to come. Uh, it's very good to have you all here. Um, I'm delighted that this evening we're welcoming back to the university uh, Professor Timothy Mitchell. Um, Tim has been the IPR Global Chair in this past year, and many of you I know would have been here last year when he gave his um, first lecture to us uh, at the same time last year. Um, and so it's a real pleasure to have him return and come to talk to us again uh, this evening. The Global Chair Scheme is a scheme the university runs which enables us to bring world-leading academics to the uh, university, and Professor Mitchell is uh, absolutely one of those. You can see his affiliation here, but uh, that doesn't really describe what he's uh, published and achieved in his career. He's written some seminal works of political theory, colonial history, um, post-colonial theory, from colonizing Egypt through to uh, rule of experts, his, his work on, another work on Egypt, and then more recently, carbon democracy, examining the relationship between fossil fuels and the sorts of democratic politics that they give rise to or shut down and close down. Um, really, really important works. And uh, last year, um, he spoke to us about the corporation as a form, what it, um, how it came into being, the claims it made to the future, the relationship between the corporation and debt, very important uh, questions. And tonight, he's going to take those issues further by looking at the concept of growth. Uh, and in particular, and I'll, and I'll just, uh, I'll speak here a little bit from the text in front of me. The issue about whether we can avert planetary catastrophe by altering the way we consume resources and adopting a new path of green growth. Is that how we should think about our response to climate change and the climate emergency? Uh, or should we look at an alternative of degrowth? That's often what we are called upon to embrace, that we shouldn't grow, we should degrow. And on both sides of that argument, as particularly as I've just described it, the assumption is that growth is a defining feature of contemporary capitalist economies. And that's the question I think Tim is going to explore tonight. Is growth really a defining feature of contemporary uh, capitalist economies? Now, before we begin, I just need to let you all know that the lecture is being recorded, so there is filming and photography uh, taking place. Please do ensure your mobile phones are switched off. If, for those of you that can't stay until the end of questions, please do leave quietly, because these doors make a real racket when you go in and out, and I don't want to disturb the questions as, as we have them. So if you do leave, please do so as quietly as you can. But I'll, with no further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Timothy Mitchell. Tim. Thank you, Nick, um, and thank you to uh, the other staff and members of, of the IPR. It's, it's really a great privilege to be back here and uh, delighted to be uh, able to talk to you again about this work I've been doing and that Nick so aptly summarized. <clears throat> Our political predicament today could be defined by two numbers, the growth of GDP and the limit of CO2. One number measures the health of the economy, the other, the fate of the earth. The first must increase if a government wants to survive in office. The second must set a limit if humanity wants to survive on the planet. The two numbers are incommensurable. Uh, they record very different phenomena. They are measured on different scales. But somehow the double imperative of economic growth on the one hand and carbon reduction on the other has brought them into relation with one another. There's no agreement about the nature of this relationship. How are the two numbers connected? Does the continued growth of the economy, the measure of progress and well-being on which modern political orders have been built, require the continued growth of carbon emissions? Or can the two numbers be decoupled? If carbon emissions are to be limited to an atmospheric concentration of 450 parts per million, what will be the consequences for the political and economic order premised upon the annual growth of GDP? I suppose the prevailing view explicitly stated or not, has been that the two numbers can somehow be disconnected one from the other. In fact, for, for more than two decades, um, the UN and international development agencies 
um, have promoted the possibility of what they've been calling green growth or sustainable development. And today in Europe, in North America, as you know, political parties, particularly on the left, are promoting the possibility of a, a Green New Deal or a Green Industrial Revolution. Those who oppose this way of thinking about the compatibility of economic growth and decarbonization um, argue from the point of view of both numbers, of the two sets of numbers. Economically, on the one hand, it's suggested we can't afford the proposals for Green New Deals. And materially, we cannot, in fact, physically decouple that kind of growth, even if it's given a green direction, from uh, the increase in carbon emissions. Decoupling Debunked was the title of a report published six months ago by Europe's largest network of environmental organizations. There is no evidence, said the report, that economic growth can be delinked from the growth in carbon emissions. Based on previous experience, the, the sources the argument was drawn from, there were a whole list of reasons um, for doubting that such decoupling was possible. The production of fossil fuels is increasing in terms of the cost and energy intensity of getting a certain amount of, of, uh, of energy out of a, a given quantity. Uh, the use of more efficient devices, more fuel efficient vehicles, for example, uh, has often led to an increase in the activity, more car driving rather than less consumption. Uh, technological change is, not, is mostly not targeted at questions of carbon reduction, and anyhow, to the extent that it is, is not happening fast enough, or if it does happen, it shifts the problem from one place, fossil fuels, to another, lithium mining, or habitat loss to produce biofuels, and so on. The report concluded then that economic production and consumption must be downscaled in affluent countries. We must declare, it said in its conclusion, a farewell to green growth. Curiously, the report, as I said, is based on evidence almost entirely from the past. And it seems, no, it seems no need to question this historical experience or to ask to what extent this evidence from the past, from what has been happening over the last generation or more, defines the limits of possibility. Instead, the conclusion seems to be that the austerity of the right is now to become, if you like, an austerity of the left, justified not by uh, anti-immigrant or anti-foreign kinds of agendas, but presumably by the very weight of the climate emergency. One can ask questions about the evidentiary base, but to me, there's a more interesting and, and perhaps prior question, because nowhere really does this report ask what I think is the right question about growth itself. What is growth? How does it measure and define our relationship to the future? Is it something material? Is it simply the condition of capitalist modernity some tendency we've developed over the last 200 or 500 years to always consume more, to need to be continuously better off. If so, wouldn't most people actually be experiencing life as a continuing improvement in well-being? Well, some are. In fact, we live in an age in which extraordinary wealth seems to arrive from quite unfathomable sources. When the US firm Uber went public last May, for example, the stock market set its value at $82 billion, an immense figure for a 10-year-old car service company that owns no cars and has never made a profit. To explain such events, the news media often turns to metaphors, curiously enough, from meteorology. They describe the investors' gains as stratospheric, what other way to explain, for example, how the $5 million stake that Goldman Sachs took in Uber in 2011, before it went public, was now worth over half a billion dollars, a return in eight years 
of more than 1,000%. More critical commentators call the firm's value something conjured out of thin air. The source of such windfalls is nothing meteorological. To understand this way of making money, we need to come, as it were, down to earth. I want to give a quite earthly understanding of what is often thought of as finance and financialization. While Uber is an extreme case, its mode of acquiring wealth is commonplace. The company created its value by constructing a practical means of consuming the future. This was a theme of my lecture last year, as Nick mentioned, and there's some aspects of that argument that I'm going to try and unfold in more detail. As I discussed last year, methods of extracting income from the future have been around for a long time. The device that Uber used, the joint stock company, whose history I reviewed a little bit last year, has existed in its current form for at least 150 years and in other earlier colonial forms for several hundred years. We have an everyday language for describing our economic relationship to the future using words like stock price, interest rate, technology, and above all, this term economic growth. But none of these terms explains how the lives of those coming later pay the bill. In fact, the language of finance, I think, blinds us to this relationship, persuading us that future human livelihoods are not the source of the gains, in a way I will explain, but are beneficiaries. Today, in the face of the climate question, we need to understand how this particular blindness is produced. The climate emergency requires us to act in relation to future conditions, but governments appear unable to take account of the long term, while their actions often seem powerless against what are thought of as the forces of global capital. Even if it were possible to overcome these difficulties, the consequences seem unworkable. Capitalism, whatever its costs, claims to have given us growth. How could we survive under a different temporality in which the future was not defined by a principle of economic expansion? Now, of course, for as long as we have organized collective life around the principle of economic growth, there have been efforts to point out its limits, that growth is unsustainable, that it is mismeasured, that it doesn't, as it's measured, it doesn't account for unpaid labor, such as housework or child raising, or comes at too great a social and ecological cost. Those are all important criticisms. But there's another way to see our relation to the future. Growth is not the logic of capitalist modernity, I want to argue, but it's alibi. In the past, we spoke of modernity much more in terms of physical expansion, physical and spatial expansion. Historians describe capitalism as a process that began in one place, in Europe, from where it gradually expanded to encompass the world. Now, we can see that as a partial account of changes that were never isolated in one place. Changes in patterns of trade and credit, the exploitation of labor and the soil, and the destruction of populations and ecosystems were always occurring at multiple and interconnected sites around the world, from China and South Asia, the Islamic world, Africa, South and North America, as well as in Europe. To see all that complexity uh, as the spatial expansion of the West reflected some aspects, but it was a product of ways of measuring and analyzing change that obscured as much as they reported. That's how we used to think. I'm interested in whether there's a similar way to revise, as it were, not our understanding of space, but our understanding of time. Not, to just, not just to be as critical towards conceptions of history as growth as we are towards geography as expansion these days, but as it were to develop a similar kind of post-colonial perspective. To include the perspective not only of those whose lands and livelihoods have been colonized in the past, but those who even today 
whose futures have been taken from them. To achieve this, we need to understand the mechanisms of extraction from the future that have operated under this alibi of growth. So my argument today is not that we should redefine growth to better capture what is beneficial and what is harmful, nor that we should try and turn it in some greener or more sustainable direction. Most of the, both those would be good things to do, but that's not my point. Nor, on the other hand, am I suggesting that we renounce growth or reverse it, that we adopt policies of degrowth. Those may also, in some ways, be useful things to think about. But any proposal either to redefine or to reverse economic growth is still operating with the language of growth, even in opposing it, which means operating with a particular understanding of what capitalism is and how it functions. I'm, I'm going to now talk a little bit more about what I mean about living at the expense of the future and try and spell it out in a little more detail than I did in my lecture last year. We've devised a number of different machineries for this mode of living at the expense of those who will come after us. And I'm going to start with the one that I also talked about last time, the most obvious one, the modern shareholder-owned business corporation. But last time I didn't have the case of Uber. <laughs> when a company is floated on the stock market, the shares offered for sale do not represent the value of the capital already invested in the business or the wealth it has already created. They don't look at the past. They represent, those shares represent a share in the ownership of its future profits. The value of a company is based not on what it has earned in the past, but on the profits it might acquire in the future. Since the future revenue is not available immediately, the value of each year's anticipated income is discounted to adjust for the delay in time until it accrues. That's the present discounted value of future profits, as it's called. And that is what it produces in the hands of financial analysts, the firm's valuation. So to return to the example of Uber, at the time the firm went public, it had not yet made a profit. It had been setting the price of rides in its cars below their actual cost to drive competitors out of business. And these subsidized operations were losing billions of dollars every year, as they still are. <coughs> to value the firm, financial analysts didn't look directly at those losses. Rather, they assumed that Uber would continue to grow until it achieved what they called market dominance, innocent sounding phrase. By eliminating alternatives, Uber and its one rival in the US, a company called Lyft, could continue to claim a share of every fare its drivers earned, a share that averages about 25%, while using their growing two-part monopoly, their growing duopoly, to limit the portion paid to drivers and increase the cost to passengers. These assumptions in the hands of the financial analysts suggested that Uber would stop losing money six years after turning public last May and within 10 years would be earning annual profits of almost $5 billion. A joint stock company is not just a promise of future profits. It's a mechanism, it's a machine for acquiring that promised income in the present. In offering shares for sale on the stock market, the investors who own a firm are selling a form of control, a form of property. The ownership today of income taken from the future. So it's not just that it's income from the future, it's that it's income available today. This is the process known in economic terms as capitalizing a future revenue. The windfalls that the initial owners earn from the sale come not from thin air, but from the political robustness of capitalization, this method of monetizing and marketing and selling on to others a private claim to the future. So this windfall represents the value of an encumbrance imposed on the firm's future customers and workers. The company's profits, and thus its shareholders' dividends, 
depend on maintaining this burden. The value of the share and the dividend on which it depends takes priority over any demand from employees for fairer wages or from customers for lower prices, thanks to the greater strength of the company compared to its workers and customers. That strength indicated by the political term market dominance. The encumbrance is not a necessary cost of running a business, but a surcharge, a rent, if you like, that the dominant position of the company allows it to impose. The $82 billion market valuation of Uber represented the present value of such an unequal arrangement of relative strength and powerlessness. The firm's drivers and passengers would repay that sum over time from their pockets. The shareholder corporation is an apparatus then for colonizing time. It provides a means of enriching a group of entrepreneurs and financiers in the present by imposing additional charge on tens of millions of users in the future. The windfall acquired today by those who set up these control mechanisms and arrange the credit lines out of which the apparatus is built will be paid from the incomes of those living 5, 10, or 20 years from now, and in fact as far into the future, excuse me, as the apparatus of capture can be extended. Besides enriching its founders, the business firm can also provide a source of gain to the retail investors and investment funds that purchase its shares, though not on the scale of the founders. Now, of course, nothing about this is unique to Uber. The corporate method of capturing revenues emerged, as I suggested, over the last century and a half as the shareholder corporation became what the great American economist Thorsten Veblen in 1923 called by then the master institution of civilized life. Last time I explored in more detail, and I'm not going to do it again today, the earlier history of the corporation, its origins particularly in colonial history um, and in colonial long distance trade. Um, its modern form over the last 50 year, 150 years emerging initially um, and especially in the form of railroads which were an earlier way before Uber of monopolizing transportation services and then subsequently in large monopolistic industries like iron and steel, the oil industry which saw the emergence of by far the largest forms of shareholder corporation and eventually many other highly concentrated industrial sectors, car manufacturing, petrochemicals, and many others. Uh, and today, of course, into, uh, in particular, the IT sector. What I stressed in that account last year was that this is not a history of finance or financialization. It's not just a history of how credit is raised and capital is formed. It's a technical history, because what matters, as I've already said, is not that there's a claim on the future, but that claim on the future is durable enough that it can be realized in the present, that can be sold on to others and traded in the present, so that you make money in the present out of an income. You can't do that just out of something uh, ethereal. Uh, you have to have uh, both a materially and technically durable method of claiming that future. Um, materially in the sense that I think it's no accident that it was the age of iron and steel, especially steel, the Bessemer process that made it possible to build railways on such a scale that you now stretched forward a possible income over 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, technically at the same time um, with the development of reinforced concrete, use of Portland cement but also iron reinforcing bars, um, which meant many of the structures could be built in new kinds of ways if they weren't built of, of iron and steel. Um, the kinds of real estate that could be developed around new infrastructural projects with these new more durable forms of building. You know, until that moment, towns and cities were things that just periodically burnt down, particularly in America where they were mostly built of wood. Suddenly they could be built in ways that they didn't burn down every 30 or 50 years. Um, so I'm not going to recap that earlier history of the colonizing corporation, but I do want to remember that it's important to think of it not just as some financial scheme, but as a, as a certain history of technical durability. Um, I actually want to suggest that 
this isn't only a story of the business firm. This mode of capturing the future, this mode of living off the future, is not only a feature. In fact, there's a far bigger and more widespread institution, not perhaps in the level of individual fortunes it leads to, but in the way it affects our lives. Um, in fact, about a decade after that economist Thorsten Veblen wrote, one can see the emergence of a second master institution, if you like, for realizing future revenue in the present, alongside the joint stock company. This was the mortgage bank and the housing market. Mortgages were little used in the United States until federal guarantees were introduced in the mid-1930s. And before then, if you did get a mortgage, you got an 80% mortgage. That meant you put down 80%, and the financial firm paid the other 20 not that you borrowed 80% of the value of the property. But, um, uh, but from the 1930s, in response to the Great Depression, one had the emergence of systems of government guarantee of the mortgage industry that made it possible for a modern uh, mortgage finance industry um, to emerge and thus to convert housing into another mode of capitalization. There was a singular, similar change in the UK. I don't know the history so well, but I think in probably in the same period, building societies, which of course had begun in the 19th century or even earlier as local working class self-help organizations were turned into uh, national credit institutions. And of course in both countries, the US and the UK, later on in the 1980s, you get the complete deregulation of um, these modes of providing housing credit. Um, and with that, <coughs> particularly of this last generation since the 1980s, this deregulation, um, there were removed almost all limits on the transformation of housing um, from a mode of providing accommodation, if you like, into what it's become today, a system of extracting lifetime credit payments. With these changes, the initial ones in the 1930s and after the war, um, and then more dramatically since the 1980s, speculative builders could increasingly sell homes, not at the cost of their material construction, but at the capitalized value of occupying a residence over the period of financial calculation, let's say 30 years. So much so that the real estate and mortgage industries grew to rival and indeed in some measures overtake the joint stock corporation as apparatuses for indebting the future and then capturing that promised revenue, the rent payments or the mortgage payments, in the present. I, I think uh, you know, part of the reason for putting housing and, um, uh, alongside the business firm is because um, I think they operate by the same principle, fundamentally, in relation to the capture of revenue from the future, even though they use different devices. They have the same dependence on durability. Um, cities no longer burn down regularly, mostly. Um, of course, they're starting to again for other unfortunate reasons, but, um, but the sort of durability of housing, of, of ordinary people's housing, is in, particularly again in the United States, is very much a phenomenon of the 20th century. Um, but that durability is partly material, partly built in certain forms, but it's also constructed out of political arrangements, legal arrangements, the kinds of financial arrangements that I've talked about <coughs> just now. Um, but I think it's also important because of the way the housing crisis is so much um, an issue in our political present. Again, I think both in the UK and in the US. Um, it works out differently in the two countries. Um, in the UK, the housing crisis today is blamed largely on what is called <coughs> the high price of land, which is a funny way to think about it, even though that is the language and the forms of calculation we use. Uh, the high price of land, in turn, is related to either planning restrictions on one side or to the hoarding of development sites by a handful of 
land speculation companies, Taylor, Wimpy, Barrett, Barclay Group, Bovis, and so on, that build the majority of new housing. Now, treating this speculative asset as a problem of land makes it seem like a question of material resources, that somehow we haven't got enough of some material thing. But the price of land is very similar to the company's share. It does not relate to the cost of creating something. It, 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 it's not representing what it's cost to bring that land into being. It's not a backward-looking measure. It's a measure of future income that we happen to represent as the price of land. It's a price that represents, after deducting the much smaller element of new housing, the material cost of building, um, the capitalized present value of the future rents or mortgage payments, whichever, that can be captured from a piece of property in a financialized housing market. As you know, both here and in the US, in, certainly in major towns and cities, housing can capture as much as 50% of average incomes. An astonishing level um, in historical perspective. Now, a minority, of course, experience that as growth. An astonishing rise in asset prices, whether of the home they own, people own and live in, or, of course, increasingly of properties that are owned um, as rental units. And that increase in wealth is measured in national accounts through the, gener through, through the payments that are generated or ascribed to people and measured as part, uh, in part, as a growth in national income. Of course, for a majority of the population, that growth is a source of impoverishment. I could multiply these examples. Housing is, I think, the starkest one in recent decades, but one could add alongside it with different kinds of histories um, the loan for purchasing a vehicle, uh, the use of a credit card, uh, the cost of a university education, and many other devices that have emerged for, course, for turning the course of a human life into a set of repayment schedules. Now, whether one thinks about the business firm, housing, all these other forms of payments going forward, the surprising thing about our relationship to the future is that we've become so blind to the way in which we impoverish it. A century ago, when that economist Thorsten Veblen wrote, it was quite clear how this method of sabotage, as he called it, operated. Today, economists and the business press have available a different language. They transpose this method of living at the expense of those who will repay the debt into what is called growth. In the case of the business firm, two moves are typically made to render impoverishment into growth. The first is to attribute the increasing value of the firm not to extraction of rents from the future, in the way I've described, but to an improvement in technology. The second, I'll talk about both of these, but let me mention the second, is to measure both the windfall gained in the present and the charges through which it will be repaid in the future as equivalent contributions to a larger good, the growth of what we have come to call the economy. So the first move is to ascribe the gain that's being made to technology. It isn't the high valuation of successful companies due to innovation, which produces increased efficiencies? Won't a firm's future employees and customers be the beneficiaries of these efficiencies and cost savings, even if they are being capitalized in the present? Let's take the case of Uber again. And here I'm drawing on an excellent series of essays by uh, an American called Hubert Horan. As Horan explains, the success of Uber cannot be attributed to any kind of technological breakthrough. Its smartphone app may have initially made the matching of riders and cars more efficient, 
But Uber did not invent the smartphone, nor the internet, nor GPS, which was actually developed and is still paid for and kept in the sky by, that I just say, the satellites of the GPS system by the US Navy, or any other technology used by car firms. And of course, the coordinated use of such systems, linking them together, was spreading in almost every area of urban life over the last five to 10 years, from ordering a pizza to catching a city bus. <laughs> it's listening to me, right? <laughs> no, I don't want the Uber. <laughs> See, I thought I could convert a touchscreen into an old-fashioned lectern and repurpose it, but obviously... No, it's over there. <laughs> oh, it was somebody else. It wasn't me. Okay. Uber's expansion was based, as I've said, largely on predatory pricing, intended to force local taxi firms out of business. Its venture capitalist uh, investors had equipped it with a fund of 13 excuse me, billion dollars, which it used to set the price of fares well below the cost of each ride. Initially, it was paying, in, in, in dollar terms, about $1.50 in costs for every dollar it was earning carrying passengers. Later, and since then, it's managed to reduce the losses somewhat, but only by increasing the share it claims from each fare and forcing down, in many cases, the income of its drivers. Uh, in some cases, the portion of the fare that a Uber takes can be 50% or more. Rather than a new technology, I like to think of this as what the um, historian David Egerton talks about as the shock of the old. As so often, the core of the new business was something surprisingly unoriginal. The century-old machinery of the private car. No machine has been more important for building the unsustainable worlds of the 20th century than the private vehicle. The car made the production of petroleum into the world's largest industry, contributing more than any other device to the growth of carbon emissions. Private cars had a parallel effect on how people lived, accounting for up to 50% of land use in cities and enabling the creation of suburbia with its energy-intensive modes of housing, land use, and privatized transportation, and the individual ownership of cars, by far the most expensive uh, item that most households might purchase, generated the first and still the largest forms of corporate consumer finance. The car industry pioneered the creation of widespread consumer debt, uh, through which everyday lives became an expanding system of funding the payment of future fees and interest to banks. Instead of developing a novel technology, the new transportation firms like Uber had found a different way to earn payments from this use of private vehicles, slotting in alongside the oil companies, the property development firms, and the financial industry. So a handful of global car service companies could now promise to investors a future in which they would extract monopoly rents from every vehicle journey. Of course, this is what economists would like the economy to look like, to quote a well-known economist who I'll cite in a minute. For decades, mainstream economists have been attributing the extraction of future rents to supposed improvements in technology. In the case of Uber, they went further. The firm actually employed its own economists to publish academic papers describing this rent extraction as a customer benefit. The company's monopoly provided the data through which such claims could be made. It worked as follows. In setting passenger fares and drivers' wages, Uber benefits from an exclusive control of the information gathered from every single ride taken. This enables them to adjust charges according to an algorithm that calculates how low driver wages can be pushed or how high passenger fares increase to maximize its own share at every moment. The system you all know, I am sure, as surge pricing. <clears throat> this evasion of fair regulation and of minimum wage payments was promoted as the technological source of new value. The proprietary data from millions of fare payments was actually the stuff that was used to construct this novel 
economic argument. The economists at Uber published their academic paper, co-authored with a prominent University of Chicago economist, to give it some added legitimacy, estimating the value of this benefit. Every dollar paid for Uber rides, they claimed, produced $1.60 in value, generating what they labeled imaginatively, using a new term, as a consumer surplus of $6.8 billion a year. This figure was simply the difference between the fare Uber charged for particular rides and the highest fare passengers might have been willing to pay, estimated from their responses to surge pricing. In other words, Uber's failure to fully deploy its surge pricing algorithm and extract the highest possible price at every instant became a benefit to those dependent on its services. The business press and the blogs of The Economists promoted these findings as evidence of the novel forms of value that Uber's technology was creating. Many economists worked very hard, of course, to make the econ economy embody the truth of their ideas, including the idea that a more efficient or more coercive pricing method can somehow create value. Stephen Levitt, the author of the best-selling book some of you may know, Freakonomics, was the prominent Chicago economist who co-authored the Uber paper. And discussing the paper on his Freakonomics podcast, he described the firm as, quote, the embodiment of what the economists would like the economy to look like. What appears as a technological breakthrough can instead be the source of new costs and inefficiencies. Uber and its rival in the US, Lyft, differed from older traditional car service firms in, uh, in many cases in one important way. The new companies didn't own the vehicles. Requiring drivers to use their own cars made the vehicles more expensive to own and manage as owners could not benefit from fleet discounts for buying and insuring them or from supervised maintenance program. And this was happening at a time over a decade when the cost of maintaining and running a car was increasing dramatically as car manufacturers moved more and more of the servicing and maintaining of cars under their own monopoly um, dealerships. <clears throat> the company set driver's wages in terms of work, but at least initially in, in everywhere they, they introduced their, their, their services, refused to class them as employees with rights to a minimum wage or employment benefits. Owning no cows allowed the new firms to evade, in many cases, the laws with which cities regulated the car service industry. There's been some pushback about that, but even in Bath, for example, you can drive an Uber car and not be a registered Bath taxi driver. You can go and get your registration somewhere else in West Somerset, where it's cheaper and there's far easier to pass the test. So it's not completely evading of regulations, but there are ways in which uh, you undermine forms of local regulation. Municipal regulation, however imperfect, had allowed for the screening and licensing of drivers and for rules ensuring public goods, such as, for example, in New York City, um, uh, the requirement to accept riders traveling to poorer neighborhoods or to accommodate those with disabilities and for fares that assured drivers a minimum wage. There were wider costs to this undermining of municipal government, which offset the benefit of any possible technical improvements. Uber's long-term goal is to destroy not only rival urban car service companies, but also public transportation. Its subsidized rides draw passengers away from mass transportation, depriving public services of income. One study in, in, of, uh, of Uber's operations across a number of major US cities found that 60% of car service users in large, dense cities, quote, would have taken public transportation or walked or biked or not made the trip if the new car service companies had not been available. And that this created a 160% increase in driving on the city's streets. To build their new monopoly, the new firms promoted the instant availability of vehicles, which in larger cities relied on surplus drivers cruising the streets waiting for rides, clogging roadways with cars at the expense of pedestrians and cyclists, and of course, increasing air pollution. That report summed up the impact of firms like Uber as more traffic, less transit, less equity, and less environmental sustainability. The future profits of the new companies were to come not from technical efficiencies or improvements in collective welfare, 
but from the opportunities for building monopoly power and from political campaigns to protect it. Uber famously hired um, Obama's former chief of staff, was it, um, as head of its PR operations. Um, Uber planned to expand its monopoly, as you know, from uh, in, into general transportation services and launched its food delivery service called Uber Eats. I don't know if it's in Bath yet, I'm sure it is, but expansion offered no technical innovation and no means of turning a loss-making company into a machine of future profits other than enlarging the firm's monopoly power to extract a rent payment from future drivers. What Uber Eats is the future. <laughs> What about the second move? I've talked about technology. The second move, describing our relationship to the future, not as technical improvement, but simply as growth. I'll come back to this theme of growth. The capture of future revenue in the present reflects an expectation of, future, of later profits. As business grows, it will create economic growth. The income may come from the future, but it's a future that will surely be larger and more prosperous. The windfall in the present is a reward, this view explains, for the, to the entrepreneurs who engineer growth and create greater prosperity for all. Like technical improvement, economic growth is an alibi, a mode in which our relationship to the future, I would argue, is misrecognized. We can distinguish two aspects of the alibi, the growth of the individual business firm and what appears to us as the growth of human society as a whole this underlying conception of growth that we see as governing our experience of modernity. We've actually come to reckon the second, the growth of society as a whole, in terms of the first, measuring the human collective as if it were a collection of business firms. The name we give this collective firm is the economy. So the first aspect is, you see, individual, the growth of the individual firm and its investors. The original entrepreneurs sell shares to other investors who acquire ownership of the company's future revenue. They're unlikely to enjoy the windfall gained by the founding investors and indeed risk losing money if the stock market decides the founders' estimates of future earnings have been exaggerated, which indeed happened with early purchases of Uber shares. But to attract them as buyers and to compensate for that risk, they offered the future rents at a discount. Discounting is important. The discount is calculated by considering what the buyers of stock might have earned by purchasing shares in another business. By convention, the value of that foregone earning is assumed to be the amount that banks would charge for extending credit to a firm, or what we call the rate of interest. The concept of interest is a modern way of describing the so-called time value of money, a strange idea, a value though, that we have now taken to be a natural property of money. I think it's better understood as a product of arrangements, such as the joint stock company, that reliably postpone income into the future. Without such mechanisms of reliable postponement, there would be no time value of money. In fact, there would probably be no money. Let me illustrate briefly how this works. Suppose the discount, or you can use a more common word, the interest rate is reckoned to be 10%. Because the share will earn its income in the future, the cost of purchasing that postponed income is discounted by 10% a year. So uh, the, invest the investor buys, let's say, a pound of the amount available in one year's time for 90 pence and one pound available in two years' time, adding another 10% discount for 83 pence, and so on up to, let's say, year 10, for, for which each pound, by the time you got to year 10, would be discounted to the price of about 39p. In other words, the investor purchases each pound of future income at a price that starts the next year at 90 pence, down to purchasing a pound for a mere 40p. This method of devaluing and purchasing a future revenue is usually described in reverse. The ordinary investor understands it not as the purchase of money at a discount, but as an investment in the present that somehow, 
grows in value over time. The term growth suggests some kind of material expansion, but nothing is required to increase in physical size or complexity for such growth to occur. If anything, it requires something to shrink. The future revenue is acquired at a fraction of its value. The shrinkage is produced by organizing this power of postponement. Money doesn't possess this ability to purchase future income at a discount by nature. The ability is derived from the fact that time can be controlled by the construction of an apparatus that will reliably capture and colonize the future. We've come to inhabit a world governed more and more by such arrangements, as I've suggested. So we diminish the value of the future by developing mechanisms to acquire it cheaply in the present and then experience the path towards that future as growth. The other aspect is that this growth is seen not just as a feature of individual business firms, but as the collective trajectory of society. To manage the control of time, a larger frame has been constructed, and I think it actually came into being to help in the, in the mid-20th century to help stabilize the study, the sometimes steady or unpredictable or uh, temporality of the business firm. This supporting armature that came into being only in the mid-20th century, as I talked about in my lecture last year, is what we call the economy, a term no economist used before uh, in its modern sense before the late 1930s or 1940s. We usually think of the economy in spatial terms as the sum of all monetary transactions within a given geographical territory, typically the nation state, but the economy is also, it's not just a spatial entity, it's also a kind of time machine, a way of organizing our relationship to the future. Like the value of a business firm, its nature is to appear to grow, to expand year on year. And one of the things the economy enables you to do is to measure for the first time what that year on year ex expansion is, something that couldn't be done before the economy was invented. As with the firm, such growth hides the fact that more and more future income has been acquired at a discount, that its subsequent repayment at full price turns a mode of consuming the future into what appears as an increase in size. Now, when households purchase and consume material goods, of course, this consumption is measured as part of the economy, and that may indeed increase. But when they pay the encumbrances imposed by monopolistic firms or the interest payments charged by banks and mortgage companies, the debts incurred for university fees, and especially for the US, um, the debts incurred for health care, and every other charge and fee imposed for increasingly privatized and monopolized services, those escalating payments all count towards the measurement of growth. In fact, in the United States, probably in the UK and many other countries, a significant part of so-called growth is now accounted for by the rents, the fees, and the surcharges of this kind, unrelated to the cost of creating goods or providing services. We live in a world organized to place the future in debt with the income discounted to the creditor and later repaid in full by those encumbered or indebted. The difference between the initial discount and the subsequent full repayment is measured as a growth in the economy and mistaken for an improvement in collective well-being. I, I began this evening just to draw this together in conclusion. Um, with that disagreement between advocates of green growth and proponents of degrowth. My purpose has not been to argue for one or other of those positions. Clearly, we need to accelerate the revolution in forms of energy production away from the use of fossil fuels. Equally, we can aim to reduce many forms of overconsumption, and especially those that are simply forms of waste, whether in its military forms. The economy GDP was invented during World War II to make it look like you could fight a world war and not pay a cost. So all kinds of things that previously would have thought of as waste was actually counted as something positive, such as the cost of fighting a war. Now, there were reasons to do that in World War II, but we still use that method of accounting. Um, 
many forms of overconsumption, but also of, of, of expenditure that are wasteful. The military is one example, but one could also cite, for example, the 30 to 40 percent of food that is discarded without being eaten. Fine, but my intention has been different. It's been to suggest that most discussions of growth, whether for or against, treat the term mistakenly as a sort of natural principle of material expansion over time. Many accounts of, our cl of the climate question blame our predicament on the phenomenon of growth. They point out, of course, correctly the inadequacy of most efforts to reduce the burning of fossil fuels and other actions destructive of the biosphere. But we often attribute these failures to a general relationship to the future that we identify misleadingly as the very logic of our history. Growth appears to us as the unfolding of a human trajectory through time, driven by the forces of modernization. We use big words like capitalism and globalization to name the power of what seems to propel us forward. These terms can make the idea of growth seem something both natural and inevitable. They also make it difficult to see beyond. Escaping the problem of growth seems to require reversing the very movement of modern history. Now, there is no denying, again, that some processes have unfolded at accelerating rates, such as the extraction of coal and oil. We also know that other things decrease, such as the extent of rainforests or the productivity of the soil under industrial cultivation and other degenerative methods of farming, or the amount of most people's leisure time. Perhaps it's time to use a word like growth in a much more limited ways, to capture some changes and not others, and therefore not as a general term for our relationship to the past and the future. In doing so, perhaps we might discover that the most widespread use of the idea of growth in contemporary politics, derived from finance and economics, denotes not the collective movement of society, but the obscure conventions of business accounting. Those conventions describe a mode of living at the expense of the future. They also blind us to the way that future is diminished. Thank you.